So here we are, and as Lori said, I'm going to be talking about politics, which, as you all know, comes from the Greek word polis, which means community, and tix, which means blood-sucking insects. <laughs> and the blood-sucking insects have confounded everyone's expectations and predictions this year. Nothing has worked out according to conventional wisdom in this election. So I, my advice to you is to just forget everything you thought you knew about presidential elections, and pretty soon you will hear from our distinguished panel of journalists, or as Donald Trump would call us, the disgusting people. Um, but first I'm going to give you a little overview of this extraordinary election, otherwise known as the Donald Trump Show. Um, and for a while, the Republican race was giving the gutter a bad name, but for the moment we seem to have moved beyond the back and forth insults of the candidates' wives, and in just the last 24 hours, we have heard from the Republican front runner, who said before he walked it back that women who have abortion should face criminal punishment. That was just after he also said that the Geneva Conventions were a problem and that Japan and South Korea should get nuclear weapons to protect themselves. Previously, he had threatened riots at the Republican Convention if he wasn't the nominee. He justified his campaign manager's alleged assault of a female reporter. He offered to pay the legal fees of supporters of his who might um, uh, rough up a protester and also said that he wanted to punch a protester in the face. So, and that's, I'm just scratching the surface. <laughs> so it's no surprise that in a recent New York Times poll, 60% of Republican primary voters said that they thought that their party's primary election was a source of embarrassment. So, um, not only do we, have we never seen a candidate like Donald Trump before, who his own Republican opponents call a authoritarian demagogue, but we might also be witnessing something that no one in historic memory has seen, which is not just a conven contested convention, which hasn't happened since 1948 when Dewey didn't get the nomination on the first ballot, but we might be witnessing the crack up of a major American political party, or at least the utter transformation of the Republican Party. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, on the Democratic side, and we can't forget about them, even though Donald Trump tends to suck all the oxygen in the room and in the media, but on the Democratic side, we have a much more traditional uh, contest. We have a anti-establishment left candidate running against a center-left candidate, and the Democratic Party is more or less unified, although that statement in and of itself is a huge break with tradition. Um, what we thought we knew about how the two parties chose nominees for president is that Republicans tend to fall in line. They like to pick the guy whose turn it is, who came in second last time. Democrats want to fall in love. They want a charismatic candidate. They want a JFK. They want a Bill Clinton. They want a Barack Obama. This year, they're not exactly falling in love with Hillary Clinton. They're more or less falling in line behind her. And the Republicans are falling apart. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the mood of the electorate, which is really important. Uh, it's the most important factor in any election. Uh, Donald Trump didn't just appear out of nowhere. He did a mind meld with a big chunk of the Republican primary electorate, particularly non-college educated voters. He said famously, I love the poorly educated. Um, and this year, voters are angry and anxious. They tell pollsters they feel vulnerable, out of control. Latest Wall Street Journal poll, only 16% of voters said they had any confidence at all in the federal government. Other institutions, including the news media, fare even worse. So who are they angry at? Well, Republican voters are angry at politicians. They're angry at the media. They're particularly angry at President Obama. They are really angry at their own leadership in Washington. Every exit poll, after every primary, Large numbers of Republicans have felt, said that they felt betrayed by their own party. They've been told by their leaders that if they just sent anti-establishment people to Washington who had no political experience and they got control of both houses of Congress, they could stop Obama in his tracks. But they haven't been able to undo the Obama agenda. They're angry at immigrants. They're angry at people who they feel are freeloading on the system. They're angry at Wall Street. 
On the Democratic side, slightly different version of the same thing. Democrats are angry at Wall Street also, at Bernie Sanders billionaires, at an economic system that seems rigged against ordinary people. So there are two slightly different flavors of this mood, but overall voters are very frustrated and fearful, and they have some really good reasons to feel that way. We've had stagnating middle class incomes for a generation. Median household income in 2014 was $4,000 below what it was at the end of the Clinton administration. We've had 10 years of under 3% growth. Um, we have low unemployment now, but wages and household incomes aren't going up. And you have what I consider to be the most important factor in American politics today, which is populism. Tremendous reaction against trade agreements, well, against immigrants and trade on the Republican side and against trade on the Democratic side. And here I know we're in a, in a state that really understands free trade probably better than, than anywhere else. But trade has been summed up by saying, trade agreements at least, everyone gets a discount, some people lose their jobs. Now, that's a, that's a very tough sell when you have low growth and when Washington has decided not to provide trade adjustment system or, or assistance or some kind of a cushion for people who do lose their jobs because of trade agreements. Um, second reason for voters' anger and anxiety is terrorism, which has come to our own shores, and voters look abroad, they think the world is on fire, and they see the world's only superpower seemingly powerless to do anything about it except for get involved in endless feudal wars. Third reason for the mood of the electorate is changing demographics. We've now had the first majority-minority birth cohort, and I think we've had the first majority-minority kindergarten class. So there's no turning back. And for a lot of white working class men, they feel not only their jobs have let gone, but their place in society is threatened. And uh, there's a lot of feeling, particularly among Trump voters, that elites look down on them. That's what political correctness means when you talk to people who are supporting Donald Trump, that they feel the elites think they're a bunch of boobs. And they are looked down on, um, and not for good reason. Not for good reason. Donald Trump, part of his message is, we will never be taken advantage of again. So he really speaks to that. So when all those things get wrapped together, and Donald Trump is really good at, at kind of mixing them into a big stew, they are a recipe for political volatility. And since 2000, every election except for 2012 has been a change election, meaning that one House of Congress or both or the White House has changed party control. So voters keep on voting for change and they never seem to get the change they want. And there's a fourth reason for voters being really angry um, at the establishment and at politics in general, political gridlock in Washington. We have all these huge problems, and the two parties in Washington can't seem to get together to try to fix them. Why can't we get anything done? Why can't we do something about our crumbling infrastructure, our education system, our tax system? You know, do some simple common sense reforms that might boost productivity and growth. You know, I covered Bill Clinton, as Lori said, for all eight years of his administration, and he used to say that being president was like being the superintendent of a very large cemetery. There were a lot of people underneath him, but no one was listening. <laughs> and that is because, one of the reasons is because polarization, which is also an incredibly important dynamic in American politics, is really baked into the cake. I think that political leadership and political will can overcome it, but polarization is really locked in. Just to give you an example, based on their voting records, there is currently not a single Democrat in the United States Senate with a more conservative voting record than a single Republican senator. Now, you might think, well, of course not. But actually, there used to be many liberal moderate Republicans and moderate to conservative Democrats, and the overlap between them is what created the center of the American political spectrum, and that's where compromises got made and deals were done, and now that center is gone. There's a, basically a black abyss between the two parties, and Democrats and Republicans in Washington live in pretty much... They, operate according to completely different political calculus. And it's not just elected officials, it's voters too. Because even though more people call themselves independents and don't want to say that they're a Democrat or a Republican, there's less and less ticket splitting voting. In other words, people tend now to vote up and down the ballot for the same party. Um, 
Now, part of polarization comes from gerrymandering, the way that districts are drawn uh, to increase the chances of incumbents to win. Um, just to give you an example, in 2012, if you took the national vote for the House of Representatives, in other words, all the House, all the Republican candidates for the House of Representatives combined, and all the Democratic candidates for the House, the Democratic candidates all together got 1.4 million more votes than all the Republican candidates. But the Republicans kept their 34 seat majority in the House. So that shows you what carefully drawn districts will do. And, but it's not just the drawing of district lines, it's also how the population has sorted itself out. In 2012, Barack Obama got 80% or more of the vote in 27 congressional districts. Now, how many congressional districts do you think Mitt Romney got 80% or more of the vote in? One. I'm assuming it was Utah. Um, so that shows you that the population has sorted itself out. In particular, Democrats are clumped together in urban areas. You know, you have Houston and Salt Lake City had openly gay female mayors totally red states, Texas and Utah, but in Houston and Salt Lake, there are big concentrations of Democrats. So Republicans and Democratic voters increasingly live in separate political universes. People tend to live near people who think like them. They listen to media that agrees with them. We'll talk about this a little more, but the media is polarized. Fox and MSNBC don't even cover the same natural disasters. <laughs> um, a, a recent Pew poll, this is my favorite polarization factoid, 49% um, of Republicans and 33% of Democrats said they would be very unhappy if a child of theirs married someone from the opposite party. <laughs> so that raises some really big questions um, for the media, who are, you're going to hear from in a minute. So. Our distinguished panel will grapple with some of these, and I will just throw some of them out now. So how do you cover an election when people are so polarized? When voters don't just have different opinions, they actually have different facts. <laughs> um, Stan Greenberg, who's a Democratic pollster, did a recent poll of Trump voters, and he, and he asked them the question, um, he, he found that big majorities of Trump voters, when they were read the statement, that illegal immigration from Mexico has been zero or less since 2008, which is a fact, they were asked, is that true or is that something just made up by the liberal media? Huge majority said just made up by the liberal media. Um, same thing with the statement, human activity is a significant factor in climate change. Trump voters, nope, don't believe it. So we hear a lot about low information voters. No, these people are not low information voters. They have a lot of information. Not all of it is correct. Okay, so that doesn't mean that Trump voters' grievances or their economic predicament should be dismissed. Absolutely not. Um, but it, it, you can understand why they would look for explanations and look at trade deals and immigrants as, as the reason. Um, there are other challenges for the media in the era of Trump. Um, he is the first truly viral candidate he tweets up a storm, he puts out Instagram videos, he doesn't have position papers or, or pollsters or advisors. As a matter of fact, when he was asked, before he put out the list of five foreign policy advisors that nobody had ever heard of, he was asked who his best advisor was on foreign policy, and he said, myself. Um, I, 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 I consult with myself, I have a good brain and I say a lot of things. Um, <laughs> So how do you cover somebody like that? Um, he, um, the New York Times, I think, tried to fact check everything he said in a 48 hour period and it was like they couldn't keep up with it. You know, the, there's, it's too much. He said that one of the protesters at his rallies was with ISIS. How does he know that? He read it on the internet. Um, so, and also just the sheer amount of free media, what used to be called earned media coverage that he gets. One estimate was that he gets $1.9 billion more of free coverage than any other candidate. Um, you know, the classic example is uh, his speech, I think it was Super Tuesday, where he gave a 45 minute press conference, mostly it was a speech, where he had the pile of Trump steaks and Trump wine and Trump water next to him. Went on and on, the, net, the cable networks covered it live. Hillary Clinton also gave a speech during that time and they never cut away to her. So um, 
<clears throat> you know, he's also been able to get the networks, because he is so good for ratings, um, to give up on the rule they used to have is that if you wanted to be interviewed on a Sunday talk show or a news show, you had to show up and be on the set, but Donald Trump can call in. So he can be on five shows in, in, in an hour. Um, Fox is the only network that has not relaxed its rule about in-person interviews. So the other question for the media is, how do you be even-handed? When he says he wants to punch a protester in the face, do you have a pro-punching in the face commentator and an anti-punching in the face commentator and they discuss it? I mean, are there some norms and values and customs and kind of rules of civil society that we say no, are not relative? So journalists are supposed to report on what a candidate says, what it means, is it consistent with what he said in the past, so that voters can decide for themselves if that person has the values and the plans and the temperament to be president. Sigh, how quaint. <laughs> or in the era of Donald Trump, how futile. Um, so, as I said, Donald Trump didn't just come out of nowhere. He really is the id of the GOP. He has completely flummoxed what you might call the super ego of the GOP, the Republican establishment, who went from complete denial. In the early days of Trump, they felt <clears throat> if they just took two aspirin and lay down when they got up, he would be gone. That didn't happen. Now they're in a kind of full-on freakout about that he, if he's the nominee, he will destroy the party in the process. Um, but there have, there, they went from an effort to actually defeat him, spent millions of dollars in advertising against him. Now the strategy is to deny him 1,237 delegates on the first ballot in the convention in Cleveland. But the Republican Party, and this is what I think is one of the biggest stories this year, is being transformed. <clears throat> the awkward marriage of a corporate-backed establishment and a blue-collar base is dissolving. Uh, we don't know what the new Republican Party is going to look like. Is it going to be a nativist, xenophobic, isolationist party or something else? Um, over time, the Republican primary electorate changed. It got more downwardly mobile, more non-college educated, whiter. <clears throat> and for decades, Republican candidates courted those voters successfully with social issues, whether it was crime, abortion, welfare, gay marriage, school prayer, they always had a message for those voters, but they didn't have an economic program for those voters. So along comes Donald Trump. He's not a conservative or a Republican. He's more in the traditional American populist tradition, like Huey Long or Ross Perot or George Wallace, which has always combined nativism and economic grievance, grievance and resentment against those at the bottom, <coughs> in this case immigrants, and those at the top, Wall Street. So Trump really is like a wrecking ball laying waste to the bedrock principles of the Republican Party, one after another. He's against free trade deals. He's against entitlement reform. So he's against small government. He's, uh, he wants to scale back from NATO. Um, he wants to deport 11 million people, build a wall, uh, prohibit Muslims from coming into the country, raise taxes on hedge fund managers. He was against the Iraq war. He thought George W. Bush lied about it. So he is not a typical Republican at all. You know, in 2013, after the 2012 elections, the Republicans commissioned a report that came to be called the Autopsy Report. After one party loses the election, they get to commission what I call the What Just Happened to Us study. And this report came out in March of 2013, and it said, you know, it had a lot of recommendations, but it had one, one and only one policy recommendation, which is that the party should embrace comprehensive immigration reform so they can reach out to the fastest growing segment of the electorate, Hispanic voters, because Mitt Romney had just lost the Hispanic vote 71 to 27 percent. Three years later, Trump and the base of the party has gone in the completely opposite direction. The RNC theory was that Marco Rubio would be the new face of the Republican Party, young, charismatic, appealing, Hispanic. Their theory was you don't have to change the pizza, but you do have to change the box. The messenger has to be more appealing. Trump said, no, let's change the pizza. Um, so what happens now? If he, can, he loses in Wisconsin, that will be another speed bump for Trump. Maybe he won't get 1,237 delegates for the first ballot. We don't know if there'll be riots or not. Um, who's the alternative? The alternative really is Ted Cruz. Um, he is equally disliked in Washington by his peers, although on the campaign trail, I will tell you, he is friendly and funny, and he um, 
He relates to voters and reporters, completely unlike his reputation for being arrogant and smarmy and overly ambitious in Washington. You know, the joke about Ted Cruz, why do people take an instant dislike to him? Because it saves time. Um, <coughs> and, and his... His colleagues, his college roommates said he would prefer as president anyone in the United States chosen randomly from the phone book over Ted Cruz. Um, so anyway, the, at this point, I think we have to operate on the assumption, it could be wrong, that it'll be Trump and Hillary Clinton. Those would be the two candidates with the highest negative ratings of any candidates running for president nominees ever. Trump has 60% on favorable ratings, Hillary has 55%. Um, Hillary, 40% of Democrats say she's not honest and trustworthy. This is what is causing Republicans to gnash their teeth, because they are convinced that Donald Trump will lose, or many Republicans are, that he'll also lose the Senate for them. But here's Hillary Clinton, a weak candidate, and after eight years, they know that that's the best chance you have for a, a party, the White House, to change hands. As in the modern era, only one candidate has ever managed to succeed a two-term president of his own party, and that was George H.W. Bush. So usually voters want to change after eight years. So we have the electoral map that we're looking at, that red and blue map that we look at every four years. Usually it favors Democrats, but Trump says, no, I can change the map because I bring so many new blue-collar voters into the mix. I can flip blue states red. I can win in Michigan, Ohio, New York, New Jersey, New Hampshire, uh, Pennsylvania. The problem is that for every blue collar voter he brings in for the first time or gets away from the Democrats, maybe he also motivates three suburban college educated women and 15 newly registered Hispanic voters. Um, so it's, it's very unclear. For every bit of Democratic schadenfreude at the Republicans' disarray, there is an equal amount of anxiety because he is so unpredictable. And everything is up for grabs this fall. The White House, the Supreme Court, um, the Senate, even the House of Representatives, which we thought had this impregnable gerrymandered fortress around it. But Paul Ryan, in the House, Mitch McConnell and the Senate are doing their best to try to somehow separate their candidates from Donald Trump. Mitch McConnell says, we're going to drop them like a hot rock. That's hard to do. It's hard to separate yourself from the top of the ticket. Ask all those red state Democrats who tried to run away from Obama and are now no longer in the United States Senate. So the Democrats will do everything they can to make every single Republican Senate incumbent, especially those in blue states, they will make their middle name Donald J. Trump. And every day those candidates are going to be asked ad nauseum, do you agree with Trump on this, on this, on this? So I think it's a recipe for an ugly negative campaign uh, when you have two candidates, if you have those two candidates with those kind of high negatives. But I would only offer this one hopeful note in conclusion that since we have been wrong about everything else this entire campaign, maybe I'm also wrong about that and everything will work out okay. So.